So good afternoon, everybody, um, and welcome to this event uh, with Jonathan Coe. Uh, my name is Matthew Wake, and I run an independent English bookshop in Lausanne. I want to thank you all uh, for braving uh, these COVID times uh, and, and coming along today. It's kind of strange uh, sitting here when everyone is, is masked. And I feel a bit guilty, actually, for not wearing a mask, um, but not so guilty that I'm going to put it back on again. And thank you, Jonathan, for coming. Um, I understand that you will have to go back and be quarantined. Uh, I will, yeah. I'm, I'm staying on in Switzerland uh, for 10 days after this. Uh, and then, yeah, I'll go back, and unless the rules have changed by the middle of next week, then I have to quarantine for 14 days. But quarantine is my normal lifestyle anyway, <laughs> so uh, I am very happy to have the excuse not to leave the house for, for 14 days and to send my daughters out to buy food for me and that kind of thing. And it's <laughs> absolutely ideal. <laughs> That's great. What are, what are you going to be doing uh, for the rest of your time in Switzerland? Um, I'm going up to uh, the Mikalski Foundation in uh, Montrichet and uh, staying in one of their cabins for, uh, for 10 days, which I'm very excited about. Um, I made a, a, a cheeky request, really. I just, it just occurred to me when, uh, when I was invited to come to Morge that maybe because of coronavirus, not all of the cabins were full. So I just, uh, on the off chance, said, uh, do you have any vacancies? And they do have a couple of vacancies at the moment. So, uh, so yeah, they said come for, come and stay for a couple of weeks if you want. And uh, I'm trying to get a new novel started. Uh, we're, we're talking mainly about Middle England today to start with. Then since Middle England, I've finished uh, another novel, which is published in English in two months' time. And now I'm starting a... Uh, another novel, I hope. So I'm in a very, it seems to be in a very productive phase at the moment, but the last few weeks of uh, lockdown or whatever it is we're going through in the UK has uh, have been, have been rather unsettled, really. Uh, it's not like the beginning of lockdown where everybody had rules which they had to abide by and they knew what they were going to do. We're in this sort of strange halfway situation where we don't really know whether we can go out or whether we can... Uh, see our family and friends or what and, and I've, I've found that very uh, disruptive to my concentration so I've actually done nothing productive or creative at all in the last two or three months so the, the idea of coming to Montfichet and being able just to focus for 10 days was really appealing. Mm -hmm. It must be quite strange if you're, if you're writing a contemporary novel let's say set now that you have to include I mean you're almost obliged to include Covid and people wearing masks does it, does it make it more difficult or? I, I don't know yet, but I'm, I'm actually, as a writer, not as a not as a person or a citizen, but purely as a writer, I'm I'm quite excited by coronavirus and the possibilities, uh, <laughs> the possibilities that it 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 throws up because you know we've we've all uh, been living a very strange life for the last uh, six months, and this this throws up all sorts of intriguing uh, narrative and plot possibilities, as far as I'm concerned, with families in lockdown and people wearing masks, uh, you know, the, the possibilities are endless. So uh, it, would, it would, as you say, be very odd to write a novel set in, the, in this year without mentioning uh, the coronavirus, but it would also be a, a missed opportunity, I think. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of glad we started this way because I really hate introducing authors because uh, I always get it wrong. Uh, and I, I always miscount the number of books they've done or if I forget uh, where they've come from. Um, well, I've been very helpful because I called my 11th novel number 11. <laughs> so all you have to do is orientate yourself around that. And there's, there's, only, there's only been one more since then, so you're on, sa you're on safe ground. <laughs> He's just stolen my joke. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you say one, but actually I can disagree with you. There's been two because you have the, uh, the fable. Uh, the Broken Mirror. That's two. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yes. So you had you had um, the Fable, then you had uh, Middle England, which obviously won the the Costa Prize, um, and then out in November is the book Mr. Wilder uh, and Me, um, which Jonathan has kindly offered uh, to read from uh, for, for for the first time. Um, but let's just just going back to to Middle England. So where for you is is Middle England? Is it a place? Is it a state of mind? What does what does it symbolise? Um, well, it, symbol, it symbolizes both. Uh, it is a place, uh, geographically speaking, which 
although everybody defines it differently, but for, for me, it's the, uh, it's the area of the Midlands, particularly the rural or semi-rural Midlands uh, around Birmingham, the city where I grew up. So very much the, the landscape of my childhood, really, and also the landscape that, uh, that Tolkien was describing and mythologizing and, and making something different out of when he wrote about the Shire and uh, the places where the hobbits come from, because Tolkien uh, grew up and got his inspiration from exactly the same area that, uh, that I grew up in. Uh, he took it in the direction of fantasy, and I obviously have taken it in the direction of uh, realism, more or less. Uh, but it's also, um, it's also, Middle England is also a kind of ideology and a state of mind and a state of belief. Uh, I suppose to put it in very crude terms, you could say it was, it represents the demographic who by and large voted for Brexit, uh, who have uh, a very traditional, very conservative, perhaps rather inward looking view of what Englishness consists of who don't find the idea of, uh, of being uh, formally connected to and uh, in a trade relationship with the rest of the European Union very appealing, uh, who are prone to nationalist sentiment and so on. And it, it's, it's you know, to, to define it in newspaper reading terms, they would read the Daily Mail maybe, or maybe the Daily Telegraph. And uh, you know, it's a very, it's a very important demographic, and 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 one which really had its moment uh, in 2016, and continues to have its moment in in some ways, uh, but which has not been written about much in recent British fiction, I don't think. And uh, I felt was a was a milieu that I understood because I grew up in Middle England, not just geographically, but also in these other terms I was talking about because I grew up in a very conservative middle-class household, really, where uh, you know, the da Daily Mail was the paper we took and that kind of thing. So I, so I do uh, know this mindset a little bit mm -hmm. and uh, felt that I could uh, have a crack at writing about it in this book. And, and in, in the book, you uh, revisit the, the Trotter family, mm -hmm. who we've seen already uh, in the Rotters Club and the Closed Circle. Um, and, and, and there's been you know, many books since the Closed Circle. Why did you decide... To, to revisit or to reanimate uh, that family? Well, I've always said that, uh, rather dramatically, I've always said that my characters are dead once I, once I finish writing about them, that they, they don't have any imaginative life for me anymore. And that, that is true of characters in some of my novels, uh, like The House of Sleep, for instance, which remains one of my most popular early novels, and, but I would never consider going back and writing a sequel about that because I just don't think about those characters anymore. But partly, I suppose, because Benjamin Trotter is a very autobiographical uh, character and his, uh, his friends are based to one degree or another on people I was at school with. They, they've always had a slightly more solid reality to me and they, they never quite died off in my mind in the same way that, uh, that some of my other characters did. And, and as I explain in the note at the end of the book, um, in 2016, when I was thinking about what I was going to write next, uh, I went back to Birmingham and saw a, a stage version, a theatrical adaptation of The Rotters Club. And uh, it's always interesting to see your work being adapted. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's painful, sometimes it's really exciting. Uh, and this was a very good adaptation and an interesting adaptation. He took all the adult characters out of the book and just made it about the school children. So there was a real focus on Benjamin and his sister Lois in particular. And the way he kind of zoomed in on that relationship as the emotional heart of the Rotters Club, which had not really struck me before as being, uh, as being a, a, a key element in that novel, that really struck me and brought these dormant, if you like, rather than dead characters uh, it, it kind of woke them up in my in my brain and made me think, uh, yeah, you know, these two people had a really interesting brother sister relationship in their teens. They'd now be in their fifties. What would they be like? How would that relationship be playing out? And that, I suppose, was the was the spark for the book, uh, Middle England. So it's, it was just one of those lucky happenstances, really. <laughs> so um, the novel itself it follows all sort of major uh, political. Um, and socio-cultural events at the time, from very small things 
you know, the sort of constant surveillance by, by speed cameras uh, to the larger um, political moments like the riots that happened in the UK, which are very similar, uh, have a very similar route to the riots we see um, happening in America after the killing of uh, George, Floyd, George Floyd. We have uh, obviously Gordon Brown's bigoted woman moment, the Olympics, and all the way up to, uh, and just after, or I think up to, sorry, excuse me, the, the Brexit vote. So my, I guess my question is, what, um, what was your starting point? Was it you, you wanted to talk about those events and, you, and then you thought about the characters or was it, or was it the characters who were essentially, or are the events more of a backdrop um, to, to the lives of these characters? Um, well, well, my last answer was a bit misleading, I suppose, in that the, the novel didn't just kind of spring to life as uh, a self-contained further episode in the lives of uh, the Trotter family and the other characters I'd already written about, uh, I was actively looking around for a way to uh, write about what was happening uh, in Britain in early 2016. Uh, we'd just had a what was to me and to a lot of other people, I think, a very surprising re uh, general election result in 2015 where the, the Conservative government had been re-elected. So we were looking at further years of the austerity program, which had been very, very punishing for people, uh, you know, lower down the income scale uh, in Britain, that that in itself was a surprise. And then, uh, because he, to his own surprise, had won this election, uh, David Cameron, our Prime Minister, suddenly had to make good on his manifesto promise that he would offer a uh, a referendum on EU membership, and. It was as if every discontent and every conflict, every kind of little uh, element in the culture war that was beginning to gather pace in the UK suddenly came to a head and was focused and was channeled into this otherwise rather arcane question of whether we wanted to be EU members or not, which not many people in the country had really been that bothered about or had, that, or had thought about very much for the last, uh, for the last few years. Um, I mean, uh, a story which I like, although it may be an apocryphal story, I don't know, but it is said that uh, the day after the referendum result, um, after Britain had voted to leave the European Union, the mo in Britain the most popular question being asked on Google was, what is the EU? <laughs> um, I don't know whether I want to believe that that's true or, or not really. But uh, it certainly wasn't an issue that people up until that point had given much, much thought to. But very smartly, uh, the people who were campaigning to leave realised that they could make the referendum not really about EU membership at all, but about, uh, about nationalism, about rather spurious questions about whether you loved your country or not or were proud of your country's history. Uh, they managed to make it about political correctness, they managed to make it about immigration, all these, all these kind of very live uh, issues which people have been getting more and more agitated about over the last few years. Uh, suddenly, somehow, that was kind of what we were voting on. And it became a, not really a vote about whether you, do you want us to be a member of this trading bloc or not, but what kind of country do you want to belong to and what kind of person do you want to be? It, was, it became... As, uh, as big and as identity-based as that. Um, and, you know, to put it simply, I didn't know how to write about all this, really, but I thought, well, at least if I go back to these characters who I know and are familiar to me, that gives me something to anchor myself in, and uh, I don't have to invent a whole lot of new uh, people to, uh, to, em to embody these different uh, questions. The characters are already there waiting for me. Uh, so it, it became a sort of more or less a technical question of how I integrated these familiar characters into uh, the main, the recent bullet points, the main highlights of recent history. And as you say, I, I chose uh, the moment when Gordon Brown was uh, then Prime Minister was caught out on his microphone describing uh, a voter as a bigoted woman because she'd asked him a question about immigration, which became a, a huge uh, flashpoint moment. Uh, and then the London riots, which spread around the rest of the country in 2011, the 2012 Olympic ceremony, where we'd uh, made such a powerful statement about our, about our national identity and how quickly that kind of... <clears throat> 
optimism and national confidence seemed to dissipate. And there we were in 2016, voting to leave Europe and, and be in the middle of a very uh, bitterly fought uh, and rancorous uh, campaign, which for a while seemed to be tearing the country apart and maybe is still tearing the country apart in some, in some ways. It's, uh, it's interesting that you touch upon the, the Olympic ceremony. I know, I know you do this in your book as well, because it was a moment, I would say, and I think is reflected in the book as well, that as a British person, you suddenly felt extremely proud of your country, you know, and it, for a lot of people, it was surprising, you know, that you could, there was something, an energy, a creativity, um, a whimsicalness, let's say, and, and it felt to me like a very, very much a moment the whole country did seem... Um, to come together and agree on yes, this this is this is who we are, um, and then the Brexit vote came along. Um, and I have a brother who who is very much pro Brexit, uh, and it's something which, in a sense, it's an issue which you, you 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 can't ignore. You can't kind of just brush over it because it's it's kind of a fundamental question. Um, do you think that there will be a time? And it's a it's a question which has certainly divided the whole country and families, and not our family in particular, but. You know, a lot of furious debate over this. Do you think there's a time when we will, we, do you think there's a time when the, when the British will come back together or do you think this is something which is just going to sort of split, split people apart uh, for the foreseeable future? Well, if, uh, if I have a criticism of my own book, which of course I don't, um, <laughs> it would be that uh, the ending is slightly too optimistic. Uh, I don't want to give it away too much uh, for people who haven't read the book. Well, we leave the European Union. That's the big. Uh, that's the big spoiler. That ha that happens about two thirds of the way through. Um, but also, the couple who are who are at the heart of the novel and whose relationship and whose differences kind of mirror everything that the country is going through. Uh, at the at the end of the book, it's it after they've separated, it's hinted that they will uh, get back together. That they're going to have a baby. Uh, and that somehow, uh, painfully and with difficulty, they're going to bury their differences and, and find uh, common ground and a future together. And that, that, that really was my, uh, the representation of, of my hope and what I felt, what I hoped was going to happen when I finished the book in the middle of 2018. And, I mean, I guess it's still my hope, but it was a bit premature, I think, because... Um, Britain is still uh, very divided along exactly the same lines that, that divided us uh, in 2016 because, as, as I said, what we were really voting on in 2016 was not membership of the European Union. It was all these other uh, much more identity-based questions. And uh, in Britain, I have no idea what Switzerland is like at the moment, but, but Britain at the moment is a kind of exhausting place because... Uh, stoked in part by by the media and by politicians in whose interest it is to foment these uh, divisions, we're we're pitched into an endless culture war. Uh, always about the same things, you know, how many refugees we should take, how many asylum seekers we should take, uh, whether we're proud enough of our country or not. I mean, the latest uh, stupid argument, I don't know if it was reported here, was... Uh, should we sing the words to rule Britannia at the last night of the proms? And, uh, no, actually that was last week. I'm out of date. This week is, is comedy on the BBC, too left-wing, uh, and is there too much left-wing comedy on the BBC? And if there is, should we balance it with right-wing comedy? Uh, nobody knows what left-wing comedy or right-wing comedy is, but apparently they exist, and if we have one, then we have to have the other, or we're not, uh, we're not being fair to half of the country or something. So, uh, you, you know, these... I'm not actually sure how much these questions really exercise ordinary people who are trying to go about their daily lives and deal with coronavirus and, and just get on with life, family life, relationships as best they can. Uh, I suspect a lot of it is confected... Uh, division, which is there to get clicks on social media and which is there to sell newspapers and, and so on. 
But whatever it is, it becomes part of the air that you breathe. You can't, you can't really ignore it. And it becomes kind of exhausting for a while to, to be living in a country which is arguing with itself the whole time. Uh, and I don't think that can continue indefinitely. Uh, but I'm not sure what it will take at this point to, uh, to start bringing about uh, a proper kind of... Uh, resolutions to these kinds of discussions. Not leaving the EU, I don't think, because, uh, you know, however we do it on December the 31st, whether we have a free trade agreement with uh, the EU or not, uh, it's going to be, people are still going to be angry. Uh, even the people who wanted Brexit will say, well, we didn't Brexit in the right way. And that was your fault, not my fault. And, uh, and the Remainers will say, you know, well, Brexit has been a disaster, just like we said it was going to be five years ago, and so the argument uh, will go on. So I was being premature to suggest that Sophie and Ian would bury their differences by, uh, you know, a couple of years after the referendum. I think it will take, I would say, a decade or two. So um, I think I think your oh, my microphone's turned off. Um, I think I think your political views. Um, are, um, I don't have my microphone. Oh, I have a microphone. There we go. <laughs> how, do, how do you get into the head of someone like um, Helena, who is in the book? She's a 70 year old uh, widower, a widow, sorry, um, and she's deeply uh, anti immigration and she, she quotes uh, Enoch Powell's uh, Rivers of Blood speech. How do you, who is someone who I look upon as very, very liberal, quite left wing, how do you get into the character of someone who is seemingly so different from you? Uh, well, it's my job to get in, into the heads of other people, uh, and I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't be able to write books if if I couldn't do it. And it's it's what I enjoy doing, and um, I don't like to talk about writing as a kind of therapy, but it's it's very helpful for me to to write from the perspective of people with uh, different. Uh, backgrounds, different experiences, different beliefs to myself, because it helps me to understand them better and reach a kind of uh, accommodation with them. The, uh, I mean, the the motto of the book, if you like, is the is, is the very simple sentiment which uh, um, our MP Jo Cox put forward in her maiden speech to the House of Commons. Jo Cox was assassinated by a by a far right extremist. Uh, at, towards the end of the referendum campaign, and it, it was the moment when we realised that, the, when I realised anyway, that the campaign had become uncontrollably uh, toxic, and bitter and divisive. And uh, in her in her maiden speech, she said that uh, she, that going around her constituency, she, she was constantly being made aware that we have more in common than that which divides us. And uh, you know, fundamentally, even though these divisions seem to be more and more amplified one way or another every day. I do believe uh, that is true, and, and one of the useful things that a novelist uh, can do is to inhabit the, uh, the minds and the emotions and the feelings of people very different to themselves and bring the readers with them so that we all understand uh, you know, a little bit more of our common humanity, to put it simply. They, uh, they do say that readers of literary fiction are more uh, uh, empathetic. Yeah, it's true. They're wonderful people. Look, look at them. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll leave, we'll leave perhaps the, the landscape of um, British politics and society behind and go to sort of more halcyon days of, uh, of cinema um, and switch our attention to your, to your new book, uh, Mr. Wilder and Me, uh, which, is, which is due out in November. Um, the, the blurb from Penguin just says it's about a naive young woman called Callista who sets out from Athens into the wider world and on a Greek island that has been turned into a film set she finds herself working for the famed Hollywood director Billy Wilder is that what you would say the book is about? I mean I appreciate this is marketing blurb but what's um yeah, I, I, uh, I tend to be quite cynical about these things and look on publishers' blurbs as marketing tools. And, and as far as that's concerned, that's a perfectly, uh, perfectly good description of the book. But uh, it's not really what it's about, I don't think. Um, 
This is actually a book I've wanted to write for a long time, and the book I was about to write before I wrote Middle England, in fact, I mean, this, this book was fully formed and conceived four or five years ago, and then uh, I felt a kind of need, I suppose, as I say, to re revisit those Rotters Club characters and to, and to address what was happening uh, in the UK. But, but having done that in Middle England and having ridden myself out a little bit as a, as a state of the nation writer, I didn't feel I had the energy uh, to go back to con contemporary Britain at this point. So it seemed a good moment to slip in a novel which is not uh, escapist exactly, uh, but is about something very different from, from our present situation. And uh, Billy Wilder has always been, I was going to say, one of my greatest heroes as a, as a 20th century artist. Maybe my greatest hero, I don't know both as a film director but also as a writer because you remember that he co-wrote all his own screenplays and he began life in Berlin in the 1920s as a, as a journalist, then as a screenwriter and only became a director because he didn't like the way that other directors were handling his scripts. Um, so in a way I approach him in this book uh, as a writer. Um, I'd always assumed that I would write a book about him one day and I'd always assumed that it would be a non-fiction book but a few years ago, I began to think, well, maybe I could write a novel about him. I don't know. I'd never, I've never written a novel about a real person before, particularly someone who is so different uh, to me in, in many ways, in his generation, uh, the country he comes from, the work he did, and so on. Uh, and then I read um, a novel by a French writer called Jean Echenot, uh called Ravel. Uh, and Ravel is one of my favorite composers, and I thought it would be interesting to read a novel uh, about him. I, w I didn't really know what to expect, but, but I found this a very, very beautiful and simple and clear novel, a novel with a great uh, kind of imaginative clarity. And, you know, I was amazed that for the hours it's taken me to, written, to read this book, I felt that I got to know Ravel far more intimately than I'd ever expected to, uh, to, to know him and to understand what it must have been like to be with him. That was really my inspiration. I thought, could I possibly write a novel like that about Billy Wilder? Um, well, I don't know, but um, I thought I would give it a shot. And uh, one thing I realized in, in my conversations with people, particularly younger people, when I started telling them what I was going to be writing next, a lot of them hadn't... They had heard of Billy Wilder, you know, wasn't he that guy who directed Some Like It Hot and, Some, and Sunset Boulevard? Uh, but it did make me realize that I'm talking about what for many people is quite an ancient epoch of, of filmmaking now, even though this book finds him at the very end of his career in the late 1970s, making his last but one film. Uh, it's still a long time ago, you know, it's, more than, it's more than 40 years ago. And uh, I wanted to give... Uh, readers a different way in. So I thought it would be interesting to approach him entirely through the viewpoint of another character, uh, a young woman. She's about 21. Uh, Wilder is making a, a film in Greece, which is where he shot some of Fedora, his last but one film. And I thought, well, maybe he would need an interpreter. So I, so I, so I, I give him this uh, young woman, Callista, who is, uh, who is there to translate for him. And she knows nothing about him. She's never heard of him. She's never seen any of his films. Uh, and in that way, I'm trying to give uh, new readers, if you like, uh, a way into understanding who he was and what he thought and what he achieved. It's, uh, it's interesting that you homed in on Fedora. As you say, it's, it's his last but one film. Um, and it seems in the book that people, you know, they know Sunset Boulevard. Uh, they, they know Some Like It Hot. But a lot of people don't know his you know, the many films he made out after those. Yeah. Why did you choose that particular moment in, in his life? Was there a, a particular theme you were looking for, or was it...? Well, um, his later films are actually my favourites. Uh, I fell in love with Billy Wilder because one evening in the 1970s on TV, the BBC showed his, uh, his Sherlock Holmes film, The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes, uh, which is a, a beautiful... Um, recreation of the of the Conan Doyle atmosphere and also has a I was about 14 or 15 when I saw this I suppose it has a very 
distinctive tone, this film, which is pitched somewhere between comedy and melancholy. And that's exactly the place I've tried to, to locate so many of my books uh, over the years. And, and the inspiration for that idea goes straight back to that particular film. Um, you know, people say he was starting to mellow that his, his early films, not just Sunset Boulevard, but films like Ace in the Hole and Double Indemnity were very cynical, very harsh. And they, th they think that he, uh, I don't know, maybe went a little bit soft in his old age. But the later works of artists fascinate me anyway. And often, uh, you know, there becomes a kind of tonal uncertainty and, and people towards the end of their careers, whether they're writing novels or making films, start to lose their touch a little bit and lose that sh kind of sure-footedness that you have when you're in your prime. But that, to me, is quite an interesting moment uh, for an artist and often a very revealing one where, where they're more... Uh, you get a more personal glimpse into their failings as well as their successes. And uh, Fedora, which is uh, the film he made when he was 70, uh, is a very flawed film with lots of things wrong with it, but it's also very uh, beautiful and elegiac and heartfelt and, and goes strongly against the current of what was fashionable in Hollywood in the 1970s. The reason he shot it in... Greece and then Munich and then Paris was that he couldn't, no one would give him the money to make a film in America anymore. They thought he was finished. So he came back to uh, the German speaking territories where he'd, uh, he'd begun his career. And, um, you know, meanwhile, Hollywood was making big bucks with Jaws and Scorsese was making Taxi Driver and Coppola was making uh, The Godfather. And the vocabulary of cinema had changed completely and, and Wilder. Uh, couldn't really, didn't know how to orientate himself in this in this world, and you see that uncertainty in Fedora. But it, to me, it's a kind of beautiful and revealing uh, and touching uncertainty. It makes it one of my favourite films. So many questions I want to ask you now after <laughs> after what you just said. I'm just trying to just just trying to pick one. Um, I mean, just what you said last there, there, there is, you know, there is this moment, I guess, in the creative life when you have to ask yourself, is, is your work still relevant? Um, and, and as you say, a lot of this book takes place on the, be on the background where the summer has changed. I think, I think there's a long discussion of Jaws uh, during the book. And Jaws was, in a sense, a paradigm moment in the film industry because everyone made lots of money and everyone wanted a shark uh, in their film. And the bigger or the more sharks there were, the better. <laughs> um, and I... I guess I would like to relate this question to you as a novelist, um, and uh, you know I think I think that you have stayed very relevant. I mean I think the success of Middle England um, proves that. But do you feel, I mean, how, how, in a sense, how, how have you done that? How do you keep tapping in um, to the vocabulary of of, li of, li of literature today, given how much it's changed with you know social media and people and the way that people consume stories. Uh, well, it's it's tough, and it's very kind of you to say that I'm still uh, doing it because I'm, you know, it gets more and more difficult in a way. And uh, you know, this is a this is a difficult aspect of the novel to talk about for me. But but I do identify with Billy Wilder uh, at that moment in his career. I mean, I'm I'm a mere youngster of 58, but uh, oh God, I'm 59. <laughs> Last month, I blanked that from my I blanked that from my consciousness. Um, and he was 70 when he, when he made Fedora and, and uh, you know, the, f the, f the publishing business is quite unforgiving but the film business is really unforgiving. And if you've had a series of flops, which he had in financial terms, you know, all his, all his most recent films had lost money, then you're, you're out on your ear basically whether you made Sunset Boulevard or not. And, uh, you know, touch wood, I'm not at that stage yet, but... But every writer of my generation, I, th I think, feels something like that, the danger of something like that mm -hmm. approaching. And uh, also, you know, um, there's the need, it gets more and more difficult to connect uh, with young readers because they often want to read young writers as, as they would. Uh, and, you know, tastes and trends 
and movements in, uh, in publishing and in literature trend, uh, change as they should do. Uh, and, you know, I, I've been very blessed in the, in the sense that I started publishing novels in the 1980s when the, the viewpoint of the, uh, the white, middle-class, Oxbridge-educated male in the UK was extremely privileged and was considered the kind of definitive viewpoint. I mean, that's what most writers were. And uh, I kind of rode the crest of that for a while, and that's, that's not the case anymore. People want, people want to hear different voices and different stories. Uh, they still want to hear mine, thank goodness, but I'm, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm uh, writers like myself are, are rightly uh, losing our supremacy in the, in the hierarchy. And there's, a, there's a, an analogy there, I think, also with what was happening to Wilder, who had been the king of Hollywood mm -hmm. for 20 or 30 years, and suddenly he couldn't, you know, he couldn't raise the money anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just a little, as an aside, it's, I have the same thing as a bookseller. You know, people are asking for books. You know, normal people, I'm sure you've all read that book. And I read it, and it just left me cold. Mm -hmm. And I suddenly thought, well, this is a generational thing. You know, I don't understand these characters' preoccupations. And suddenly I felt very old as a reader. And so I read all, all, all my old favourites again and felt a bit better about life. But it's amazing how things, how things change. I mean, I, you know. Yeah, it's, it's inevitable and, and necessary. Mm -hmm. So ju just, just going back uh, more, more specifically to the book, um, it's, it's a fictionalised account of something that actually happened, the, 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 the shooting of Fedora. Um, there's a, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm interested to pick that apart a little bit and perhaps I could use a particular scene uh, in the book to do that. So they are shooting a scene um, down by the sea, and they've got a local man who's a, who's a boatman um, to take one of the, the star uh, on a journey. Um, and then something very funny happens. I don't know if you want to give it away or not. But in that sort of scene where you, I, mean, I guess this happened, this must have happened, how much of that particular scene, just as, as sort of a, an example, actually happened, and how much of it is, is your imagination? Well, as I began to research the book, I, I realized that I'd, I'd left it just that little bit too late, really, because the film was made, uh, the film was shot 43 years ago, and many, many of the people involved with it have died now, uh, you know, most of the key creative people. And uh, at times I felt it was a kind of cursed uh, project. I, I, I tracked down the Greek assistant director of the film, uh, through, a, through a journalist friend I had in Greece, and that it took a few weeks to locate him and then to get his email address. And then for some reason I, I dithered a bit and I left it two more weeks before I emailed him, and then I emailed him, and uh, he died the day I emailed him. So, uh, <laughs> I, you know, that was, that, 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 it felt that I was, uh, I realized at that point I was in a kind of race against time. So it was quite difficult to find particularly specific information about the, the shooting of the scenes they made in Greece, which was about two weeks worth of shooting, I think. Uh, but I found, a, just on Google, I, I found a, a Greek blogger who, uh, who runs a blog about the island, Lefkada, where the film was shot. And uh, she wrote a little blog about uh, the fact that it was used as one of the locations for Fedora and that her father was the, uh, had a, a quick appearance in the film as the boatman. So I emailed her and got into a dialogue with her, and she was very helpful and very, uh, very nice, and told me a lot about uh, the island and so on. And I, and I wanted to put in a kind of tribute to her and to her father, really. So I, so I knew, you know, that obviously they were, they must have been using locals as extras in this kind of role, uh, where there wasn't much of a story there. So I, I built something upon it and gave him this little moment which uh, is really a, a practical joke that Wilder's co-writer, uh, Izzy Diamond, plays on him on the set using this, uh, using this kind of cooperative boatman who plays along with it. And uh, that was the kind of thing I found myself doing repeatedly throughout the book, taking incidents uh, where I knew something had happened, but I couldn't find out exactly what had happened, so using that as, an, as to give me the liberty to... Uh, to, to invent something, something, you know, meaningful. Mm -hmm. So, uh, shall I read a bit and, yeah, exactly. uh, you know, that, that's another example of the same kind of thing, really. So I, I try to imagine what kind of things Callista would be translating for Billy Wilder 
and also how he would have spoken and so on. So this is the first scene in Corfu where she is her first day of working for him where she has to translate. He's interviewed by some local journalists. Um, while there, I don't know if any of you have ever seen footage of him, but he had a very distinctive way of speaking. He kept his very strong uh, Austrian accent all through his life, and he never really mastered English completely. So he used to stutter and uh, hesitate over words a lot. I can't really do an impersonation of him, so I'll just read it in my own voice. The publicist had arranged for Mr. Wilder to give two interviews to local newspapers late in the morning. It was a quarter past 11 when I arrived in the hotel lobby. By then, he'd already been on set for more than two hours, and he was looking very pleased with himself. So, now we have shot our first scene, he told me. Now we have started, and there is no going back. Mr. Holden, like the professional he is, played his part to perfection. He walked out of the doorway of the hotel, he crossed the street, he sat down at one of the tables in the square over there, and he shouted, Waiter! He did it all on the first take, and unlike some of the actors I've worked with, he did not have to have his drama teacher on the set with him, holding his hand and telling him how to dig deeper and deeper into the meaning of the scene. So it was all done very quickly. And now, while they're doing the next setup, we have a few moments to, to give to the journalists. I hope it's not going to take too long. I was amazed by how happy and animated he seemed. He looked about ten years younger than he looked in Beverly Hills last year. His eyes sparkled and he was lighter on his feet. Mr. Wilder, the publicist, said, the first journalist is here. He was a worried-looking, bearded, dark-haired man of about 25. He sat perched on the edge of an armchair while Mr. Wilder sat back on a sofa, relaxed and at ease, puffing on one of his little cigars. I was placed on the sofa next to him, sitting up straight, my body taut and alert. This was my first attempt at interpretation, and I was determined to make a success of it. First question, the journalist said. In your film, The Spirit of St. Louis, James Stewart plays the great aviator, Charles Lindbergh. Was your intention to make a radical analysis of the fascist tendencies of the American state? I translated as faithfully as I could. Mr. Wilder gave me a brief questioning glance as if to confirm that this really was the question, and then said, well, not really, you know, I don't consider it that much of a political picture. I was more concerned with showing how he made the journey, the flight across the Atlantic. After I had translated into Greek, the young man nodded and wrote a few words down on his notepad. Lindbergh himself, he said, is an archetype of the American male whose display of heroism is in reality just a thinly constructed mask for his deep uh, psychosexual insecurities. Would you agree? Once again, I did my best to translate. This time, Mr. Wilder's glance towards me was not so brief and even more questioning. Well, he answered, puffing on the cigar more energetically than ever, all I can say is that Mr. Stewart must have given an incredible performance if this is what you took away from the film. It certainly wasn't there in my direction. After I translated this reply, the young man scribbled on his notepad at even greater length. Then he said, The phallic symbolism of his plane, the spirit of St. Louis, is obvious. Lindbergh, in effect, is trapped inside an enormous penis which carries him towards an inevitable destination which cannot be changed. Is this how you feel as a director, trapped inside your own masculinity? I translated the question. Mr. Wilder leaned in towards me. Is this guy for real? He asked. I answered, I'm just translating as best I can. He drew on the cigar a few more times, exhaled a long plume of smoke and said, look, you have asked me three questions. Not only do I not understand them, in spite of this lady's excellent translation, but they're all about a film which I made 20 years ago, which was not a success, which I should never have made, which I never think about, which I never want to talk about, and all I can say about it, frankly, is that I would burn the negative if someone gave me the opportunity. Do you mind if I ask you why it is that you are so obsessed with this particular film? After this question had been translated for him, the young journalist replied, it's the only film of yours I've seen. <laughs> Good, said Mr. Wilder, reaching out to shake the journalist by the hand. In that case, the interview is over, and neither of us needs to waste any more of our time. Next. Next was a much more confident, indeed rather intimidating woman of middle age wearing a tan business suit who flipped open her notebook briskly and said, Mr. Wilder, you are the director of 24 motion pictures, 23 motion pictures. You are here in Greece to make your 24th. It's a very great honor for us. From Some Like It Hot to the front page, from Double Indemnity to Sunset Boulevard, you've run the gamut from comedy to tragedy, from satire to melodrama, showing yourself to be the master of every style. Who can forget the superb performances you drew from 
Charles Lawton in Witness for the Prosecution, from Jack Lemon in The Apartment, from Audrey Hepburn in Love in the Afternoon. This morning I watched as you directed a scene from your new film. It was a privilege and a pleasure to watch a true genius of cinema at work. In directing the scene, you were obliged to halt the shooting at certain points because of the level of traffic noise. My question to you is this. Traffic congestion in Corfu town is a serious problem. What do you think can be done about it? Do you approve our mayor's proposal to close Academia Street to cars and reroute the traffic along Mustoxidi, introducing a new one-way system? I translated the question. Mr. Wilder nodded thoughtfully and tapped ash from the end of his cigar into the ashtray in front of him. I don't remember his answer. I just remember starting for the first time to feel a little sorry for him. So in just one moment, I'll pass the questions uh, over to you. I just have one last question for you, Jonathan. Tell us a little bit about um, Callista. I mean, it's the book is narrated from her perspective. Uh, who is she and why, why did you use her as your uh, narrator? Um, well, as, as I said, I wanted, to, uh, I wanted to use a younger character in order to uh, give readers who weren't familiar with Billy Wilder uh, a way in to his... Uh, his world and his, uh, his, his way of being. Um, but there's another element to the novel which I haven't really talked about, which is Callista in her older age, because as she writes her account of working with Billy Wilder in 1977, the year is actually 2013, and she's, uh, she's in her late 50s, as I am, and uh, she's, she's looking back, and uh, she feels... Uh, finally, that she's beginning to understand what Billy Wilder must have felt like in 1977. She has become a film composer, writing uh, soundtrack music, but she can't get work anymore. Nobody wants her kind of music anymore. Uh, and the other thing that has uh, given a kind of meaning to her life in the last 20 years has been uh, motherhood and her relationship with her daughters. And her twin daughters are just about to leave home and go away to university, and she's left uh, by herself with her husband. And it's a, it's a difficult moment in her life, both professionally and personally. And she says at one point in the book, she's watching, she's watching a, 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 a clip of Billy Wilder giving a press conference, and she freezes the frame on his face and tries to read what he's... She sees a kind of disappointment there, and she tries to read the disappointment. And the phrase she uses is that she, he's realized that what he has to give, the world no longer wants. And that's, uh, that's what she started to feel as well. So uh, it's, it's not just a novel about um, a film director, and it's not just a novel about a young woman having an adventure on a Greek island. It's also uh, about what it means to be uh, approaching that period in your life where uh, you know, one story comes to an end and you have to find a new one which will give your life uh, just as much meaning. And writing her memoir of, uh, of working with Wilder is what enables to Callista to kind of get through this moment. Thank you very much. Right, does anybody have any questions? Mm. And so the Ian relationship for me, there's a huge class chasm that impacts their relationship that is never addressed. Or I would I'd certainly be unaddressed. Mm. So I'm, I'm just wondering if that's a deliberate thing or um, did you deliberately decide to kind of take that out of the equation? 
Um, well, people are always uh, talking about Britain's class system and how impactful it is. Uh, and of course that's true, but, but increasingly um, I tend to see it I tend to see that as playing out in, in other areas. And the, the main difference, there are two main differences to me between Sophie and Ian. One, one is that he is from the provinces and she's mainly from London. So it's, uh, uh, it represents the London uh, provincial divide. Uh, but more importantly than that, really, she's not just university educated, but she's an academic and uh, would that is really how she how she defines herself. I mean, her her academic work and so on is extremely important to her. Um, Ian, it's implied. I don't know if it's ever stated in the book. Uh, hasn't been to university. He's a he's a kind of driving instructor or speed awareness instructor. And uh, the real uh, divide between them uh, is an educational one, which you know maybe that is the same, or maybe that is related to a class divide. Uh, but it was it was in their it was in their different uh, educational background and attitudes towards education that I, that I felt the most uh, serious division between them was. Um, what was the other part of your question? The one before class. Oh yeah. Um, well, I think it's true that uh, if you take a character like uh, Helena, who, who Matthew referred to at the beginning then how people will respond to her depends very much on their own political beliefs. And a lot of people might read her speeches and think she's absolutely right. Um, I tried, uh, although I, I disagree with almost everything she says, I tried to be as neutral as possible in, 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 in writing her words. Uh, and at times it felt more like an exercise in kind of di dictation or transcription than, than actual... Uh, invention on my part because I had a very clear image of her in my mind and a very clear uh, image of her voice and I can remember now the huge set piece speech that she makes right in the center of the book chapter 23 um, where she uh, she's talking about uh, she, she starts by talking about the ban on fox hunting and then riffs on from that on to political correctness and everything else I, I have a, a vivid memory of writing that passage uh, very quickly and in a, in a kind of you know, more like how a medium, I imagine a medium operates in a seance really. I just felt that I could hear everything that she was saying and it was just a question of writing it down as quickly as I could. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, I think depending on which side of the debate you're on, you will, you will read that speech and have a response to that speech in completely different ways. Um, what I what I hope uh, you might be wrong about, if if uh, I understand your implication correctly, is that, is that Remainers uh, might dislike Ian, even though he's on the the Brexit side of the debate, uh, because Ian to me is is a character I'm I'm very fond of, even though again uh, I disagree with. Um, many of the things that he thinks and says, but I, I tried not just to make, he's not just sympathetic in my opinion, but he, he's quite heroic in some moments because he's one of the people who intervenes during the, the, the riots in Birmingham, for instance, and, and tries to uh, save, save someone uh, from a dangerous situation and gets injured in the process. Um, so he's, he's kind of the hero of the book to me. And, and also, you know, Sophie, Particularly in the second half of the novel, can get quite, uh, quite patronising and, and nasty towards him, and you know the, there's one particular argument they have towards the end of the book, which is really when their divisions become irreconcilable. And I'm sort of on his side as much as hers, at least tonally in the way that the the argument is conducted. So. Um, you know, one of the things I've tried to, sh to show in the novel is it's not just what we say to each other that matters uh, in these arguments that we're all consumed by, but it's, it's how we say it, the tone in which we say it, the tact or the lack of tact with which we say it. And, uh, you know, Sophie is uh, a, bit, a bit tactless with Ian sometimes. 
Another question. As a, you can take it up to ask a question. I was curious, Jonathan, if uh, when the birth kit issue happened, the election happened, and it didn't seem that um, Ireland and Scotland weighed in so heavily in, as it is now post pandemic, because they don't really agree with the way um, Boris Johnson has uh, you know, handled the pandemic. And there seems to be more of a risk of it breaking up the United Kingdom. And do you think this would maybe make people in the UK in London and or England um, think to go back to the EU? If that could be a, a serious threat? Uh, you know, this is one of the things that makes me so certain that the Brexit debate is really about something else completely because people are so passionate and entrenched about it and think it's so important now that we leave, that we leave the EU that they're prepared to risk the breakup of the UK and to make it much more likely, in fact, by, by leaving the, the EU. Uh, that to me is astonishing. Uh, and I think the last poll I saw something Something like 75% of people who wanted to leave the EU were prepared to see the breakup of the United Kingdom if this is, uh, if this is what it took. Uh, and, you know, these, these are people who a few years ago would have been horrified at the idea of uh, Scotland and Northern Ireland uh, breaking away from England. So, um, you know, I, we're still consumed by this sort of frenzy. We're at that point in an argument when you're still shouting at each other but you've forgotten what it is you were arguing about in the first place. Yeah, that, that was just a very uh, effective scare story that the Leave campaign used to persuade people uh, to vote with them if, if, if you challenge, uh, you know, I, I would, imp I suspect if you challenged any of them now and said, you know, what was all that nonsense you talked about Turkey back in 2016, they'd deny ever having, uh, they'd deny ever having said it. Um, so, uh, you know, as, as I said to Matthew earlier, People's, uh, people's opinions are not changing, they're getting more and more entrenched, and, and worse than that, they're beginning to forget what they disagreed about in the first place. Another question? Uh, ins inspiration is never guaranteed, unfortunately, and anyway, it comes in the most unexpected places and sometimes comes at the busiest uh, times of your life when you're most distracted and that, that is the reason that it comes then. So, uh, so uh, booking myself 10 days in a, in a, in a cabin in, in the Swiss mountains would be, a, would be a foolish thing to do if I felt it was going to guarantee inspiration. Um, I know it guarantees me a nice ten days, so that's mainly why I'm that's mainly why I'm doing it. Uh, and if inspiration strikes while I'm there, then that's a, that's an upside. Um, yeah, the the writing process changes with every book, but I wouldn't say there was a there was a pattern to it. Um, Speaking very generally, I suppose the pattern is that it gets harder every time, not because you don't learn some useful shortcuts along the way and learn how to avoid certain mistakes and that sort of thing, but just because, for me anyway, uh, after, after 12 novels, 13 now, uh, the danger of uh, repeating yourself becomes stronger and stronger. And... Uh, all, all, even when I was writing um, Mr. Wilder and Me, I, I became aware that although it's a completely different book from uh, The Rain Before It Falls, which I wrote about 13 years ago, uh, structurally, uh, in many ways, it's almost identical. 
and uh, you know I didn't I didn't realize that until quite late into the writing process and uh, this is going to happen more and more I suspect and the problem particularly now after having written uh, Middle England which is a which is a long novel and where I really um, covered pretty much everything I wanted to cover in the state of the UK from 2010 uh, to 2018. Uh, if I'm going to write a, another novel, which I would like to do about the, the present moment uh, in Britain, then yeah, the, the danger of the material overlapping too much uh, with Middle England is, is quite acute. So uh, it's, it's, it's literally a question of finding something that I haven't done before. And uh, you know the, the 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 scope for that becomes narrower and narrower with with every book. Billy Wilder had the same problem, so I'm in I'm in good company. <laughs> so, so this unfortunately brings us uh, to the end of the session. Um, I think Jonathan will be signing books at the back. He'll be signing the they are for sale, and apparently he'll sign the books which have been sold here. So if you'd like a book, they're all back here. Um, thank you again, everyone, uh, for making the effort to come. And thank you very much, Jonathan. It's been great fun. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.